All right, guys, what's up? Welcome back to the 3 of 7 podcast. Son, we've had a had a jam up day today, haven't we? We have. Day on the range with uh, me, Blake, and our brother, Justin Fulcher. Got our brother, Justin Fulcher, on the pod today. Yeah. What's up, man? What's up? Good to be here. How was, uh, how, was, how was the day on the range from your perspective? You know, the day on the range was great. I think uh, it was a good opportunity to practice uh, being present, being deliberate about actions, and really, uh, yeah, had a good, good fun uh, learning all the different dynamics. Yeah, good yeah. Day. Pull that mic towards you just a little, Justin. There you go. All right. Get that thing. I want. I want to make sure people hear you, man. Um, <laughs> Sounds good. And uh, we worked through a lot of stuff today on the range. Yeah. So today, Justin, Justin came out a few months ago and did the pistol course that Blake and I uh, teach out there. And then today was the rifle course. And then also we really worked into some combat shooting, transitioning between the two different weapons platforms, rifle, pistol, moving and shooting, uh, shooting from cover, uh, panning around walls. I mean, we worked, we worked through a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. It, was a, it was a jam up day, but the Georgia heat is amongst us and the mosquitoes was rough <laughs> they was showed enough amongst us full on today dude the mosquitoes was rough son just adds to the benefit now <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so a little bit about well i i can't tell you too much about justin because he's like i was watching austin powers the other day and austin powers got the international man of mystery award and I feel like Justin could get the International Man of Mystery Award. Um, Justin shows up to the basic course. Uh, what what team were you on, Justin? 003. Represent. Really? Wow. Yeah. So, team three. So, yeah, Justin shows up to the basic course. And just being around him, we were, we were like – attracted to him as a person you could tell all right there's something about this dude but when we're out on the basic course we don't we we treat everybody like team members we don't dig a lot into the first question we ask isn't hey what do you do for a living right Mm -hmm. so that kind of that stuff kind of just gets unpacked along the mission and, and throughout the time that we get to spend together so we know a little bit about justin but i'm looking forward to learning a lot more uh, first of all, brother, where, tell me a little bit about just where you, where you grew up and how you grew up, man. Cause I don't know any of that and I want to know. Yeah. Yeah. I, I grew up in uh good old Charleston, South Carolina. So, okay. Uh, I was born in California, but at a young age, my parents, uh, moved the family out to South Carolina, which, um, was definitely a, a big transition at the time, but very thankful that uh, they had that foresight and made that move. But uh, childhood was good. Uh, a lot of time spent in the woods, uh, spending outside, uh, a lot of unstructured time to explore and and just really learn about life. And what'd your mom and dad do, Justin? Uh, my dad was a truck driver uh, working for a construction company, and my mother was uh she worked part time at a school and then uh, was a stay at home mom with us. Okay, awesome. Um, I'm gonna ask you to pony up on that mic, son. All right, let's pony, do it. Pony up on that thing, <laughs> son. Um, and so you're growing up in Charleston, South Carolina. You're spending time out. You're an outdoorsman. I mean, even now, you obviously you came out of the basic course. You're all about being out on the range. You're going on the Alpine trip coming up in august by the way if any of you guys listen to this if you got some random email <laughs> inviting you to a airbnb an airbnb in august in a undisclosed location um you might be going on the Al- alpine trip the point zero 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 one percent of the listeners <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> the 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 six of, the six or seven of you that got that um anyways so outdoorsman now coming up through school man because one thing that interests me about you is uh i know you're a super humble guy but it doesn't take long to realize you're highly intelligent um how'd you do in school you know i've i was very blessed my 
parents always encouraged us to read and learn and really did whatever they could to support anything we were really trying to do to better ourselves. So school, I mean, for me, school was pretty easy, I would say. Um, I spent a lot of time, uh, as I was growing up, computers were starting to really become mainstream. And I remember the first time we got a computer, um, I was about five years old and I spent a lot of time uh, really just diving into that whole tech world and I'm extremely thankful that uh, my parents encouraged that. And yeah, so I, I spent a lot of time learning outside of school, but, uh, but I've always been fascinated with uh, learning and trying to better myself. Yeah. Yeah. What attracted you to that computer, man? Is it was it just something like interesting about it to you or? Yeah. You know, it's, it's tough to say exactly. It was just, it was so, so fascinating. It was mind yeah. blowing of just even just uh, doing simple things on it, like, you know, pointing and clicking and uh, mm-hmm. I mean, playing games and uh-huh. really just trying to understand what this thing did and how it works. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as a, as a young, uh, a young man growing up, it's uh, it was, it was fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. How old are you, Justin? Uh, I'm 28 now. 28. Awesome, man. You've done, you've done a, I, I, I don't know what all you've done, but I know you've done a lot of stuff. And, and so I want to, I want to start to kind of unpack that a little bit, man. I, um, from the point you graduated high school, did you know where you, where you were going to go with your career or, or what, 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 what was that time of life looking like for you, man? I had no idea. <laughs> okay. I, um, you know, I, I knew that tech was going to be a big part of that. Um, especially during high school, I, I got very involved and actually, uh, started a software development company while I was in high school. Um, just doing simple things, making websites for small local businesses. Mm -hmm. And I saw at the time just how powerful technology was. And it was a unique point of really development where, you saw all these different businesses, all these different people, and they were just coming online for the first time. Mm-hmm. And for me, I, I saw that as a, a tool to potentially do a lot of good, whether it be you know helping a small business or really for me, it was, I was playing. It was, it was having fun to, to learn about the technology. I got into programming mm-hmm. and uh, so I, I didn't have some grand plan or some grand ideas about what would happen after I graduated. Mm-hmm. But I knew tech was going to be a critical part of that. Okay. I, I want to ask you real quick, it just popped into my head too. How, because you do love being outside and you're, you're, you're a gritty dude, you can handle discomfort. Um, physically, you're a strong person. Mentally, you're a strong person. How have you managed to balance the, the tech side of you and and the part that is passionate about that with your tough gritty outdoors running and gunning side man because it's a (laughs) dynamic that is you don't see it man i don't know that i've ever met anybody that way people that do that like that are so passionate about the tech stuff usually that that other that that other side is missing right Mm -hmm. so how have you how has that dynamic stayed alive (laughs) man well i mean growing up uh being outdoors and being part of nature was always something that I really enjoyed. And I think it comes down to just being intentional and being deliberate about that. Um, for many years, I realized I lost that part. I was focused Mm. way too much on being inside behind a computer. And I realized one day that I wasn't fully complete as a person by Mm. really ignoring that aspect of, such an important part of life. Who you were, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Wow. So that did so did did that just hit you and then you started becoming more intentional about feeding that side of you, that other side of you that you're passionate about? Yeah, I would I would say so. For for me, I realized I was getting like very, very focused on the tech and that aspect, which was great, but I realized I was losing a part of me that I really enjoyed, which was being out in nature and experiencing just the beautiful world that we live in. And I realized 
if I'm not intentional about that, then it's just not going to happen by chance. Uh So just always trying to be intentional. I don't always succeed, but uh, trying to make that an active part of just who I am as a person. That's right. Yep. I get that brother. So what happened after high school, man? Yeah. So before graduating from high school, I was kind of wondering whether or not, you know, going to college would be a good idea, whether keep going with the business that I'd started, which was just a small business, uh, you know, building websites uh, for local companies. And that was really interesting and built up a small team around that. And so I was at a unique phase of life of where there were options potentially beyond going down a more traditional path. And so I decided uh, I didn't want to not college without trying it. So I ended up uh, going to Clemson University for about a year. And uh, that was a great experience. Uh, Upstate South Carolina is Mm -hmm. incredibly beautiful. And that was one of the areas of where I intentionally got back into nature, just driving through the mountains of South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, that upstate area was a good reminder that that's a part of me that I I want to rebuild and redevelop. And I got a lot more enjoyment doing that uh, than being in a, in a classroom uh, full of, you know, a hundred people. So (laughs) um, I've I've not been good, uh, too good uh, with sitting in a classroom for hours on end. Yeah. Yeah. And so you, you went for a year. What, 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 when did you decide to go a different route and how did that happen, man? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. So I was 19 years old, spent about a year in Clemson, had a great experience, great social group, but I realized I was actually too comfortable. It was it was not not that it wasn't hard or challenging, it just was a lot of the stuff came pretty easy for me. And it's in an environment that's so close to where I grew up, which is great. I I love South Carolina. I love where I grew up, but I felt like there was something more that I wanted to, to go beyond to stretch myself. And so on a bit of a whim, I planned to spend uh, three months traveling in Southeast Asia Mm -hmm. and uh, ended up uh, in January after a year in, in Clemson dropping out and jumped on an airplane. And that took me to Southeast Asia. Why Asia? (laughs) Well, you had to have had to have some kind of <laughs> idea or plan. There, I, I wish I could say there was some grand plan with that. But for me, it was just this curiosity about the other side of the world. Mm. I mean, Europe seemed very similar. Um, Latin America is pretty different. But, uh, you know, it's it also felt a bit close to home. And so Asia was like the opposite side of the world. So if I really wanted to go out and stretch myself and like Mm -hmm. really try to understand what's something totally different than what I'm comfortable with. And I I only plan to spend three months traveling around, but uh, I I got hooked on just the, the energy and all of the kind of excitement that was happening there in terms of just how much change was happening so rapidly of where a lot of, countries that were rapidly developing and going from kind of third world to first. And I was witnessing that firsthand. And so for me, that was a fascinating thing to see. And all of that was powered by technology. Mm. People getting access to, you know, affordable smartphones. Um, I mean, heck in, uh, in India today, you can get uh, a smartphone for, you know, about five us dollars and you can get 4g internet for, about a dollar a month Dang. and it's it's incredible and so for me it was the early days of that transition and for some reason I was drawn to just wanting to understand like how that would change society and how that would change people and what started as a kind of a three-month very little plans of I'm gonna go kind of see what's going on over there yeah didn't know much about it at all almost nothing and uh then that led to the better part of the last decade, uh, actually spending time out there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I got to back up and, and 
I got to ask you, I mean, you show, where, where did you, when you left the States and you flew over there, where did you touch down and what was, what did you do from there? Yeah. So the first place that I visited outside of the U.S. on that trip was Singapore. I was originally en route to uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand. So it's a second largest city in Thailand up in the mountains, which uh, again, trying to be intentional about being close to nature and uh, bring, bringing that into part of my lifestyle. Yeah. But I touched down in Singapore just kind of inadvertently because it was the, the way that the stopovers of the plane happened. I spent a few days there and I mean, it was just incredible to see just the energy and the pace of life and just how it was just so different. It was so foreign to me. Yeah. And, and for me, that was something I wanted to explore further and, and learn about. Yeah. Yeah. How long did you spend there in Singapore? Well, at that time I just spent a few days. It was just okay. a stopover. Um, that wasn't my final destination, but, um, for about a year, I basically lived as a kind of a nomad around Southeast Asia and uh, spent a couple months in Thailand, a couple months in the Philippines, Indonesia. And throughout that first year, I was always transiting through Singapore. And I didn't know at the time, but I just knew that there's something about being in Singapore and just being in the heart of all this change that's happening mm -hmm. that I didn't know when or why or, <laughs> or how even, but I knew that I would spend some extended periods of time there wow, in Singapore. Wow. Yeah. And you're doing all this by yourself. You're traveling over there all solo. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, when I went to Asia, I didn't know anybody. Um, it was all solo. Do you speak any of the lang I mean, language or? I, I only, only English <laughs> at the time. And so you know, oh, it yeah. was uh, a big eye-opening experience, and it was just fascinating to me how much bigger the world was than what I grew up in, and just, like, also how big of a need there was for, really, the potential for impact, mm. um, and mm. seeing, seeing firsthand, you know, places like Indonesia, where you have huge amounts of poverty and huge amounts of just people that need a lot of help. And for me, technology and seeing that change lives in that way, yeah. there was something about that where I knew I needed to be in a part of that. Yeah, um, I didn't know exactly how, but I knew that being there and kind of jumping into that situation and trying to make an impact was something that I wanted to do. Yep. You were there. You were putting yourself in the mix. And that's what I want to know is – when did your, I guess, what what would you consider the start of your mission? So as you're bouncing around that, that first three months or that first year as a nomad, you're seeing, like you said, these countries that are in need. You're identifying needs within these certain communities that you visit. Um, and you're you're seeing the transition, like you said, from the third world to the first world, and that's being done through technology. Where does your mission start? Where do you find your place, or when do you find your place in all of this, man? So for the first year, one of the big objectives for me was simply to learn. I wanted to try to understand. I wanted to learn about what was life like. Um, in Southeast Asia and just put myself out there, meet people, try to understand, try to build community and just learn first. Mm -hmm. But there were so many different moments of where I was drawn to the problem of healthcare and the fact that, you know, you could see people on the side of the road. They don't have even running water, but they had access to a smartphone and mm. a young girl is watching YouTube and you think, how is it that so many people lack basic things like running water and even in what I was drawn to is healthcare. Yeah. But they had access to affordable smartphones and the internet. And for me, it was just mind blowing one that, 
you know, people didn't have that same level of access to, to healthcare, but almost more importantly, that they did have access to the internet. And not everybody at the time, of course, mm -hmm. but that's changed substantially over the past five to 10 years. And so for me, it was this really interesting mix of technology plus healthcare plus the kind of mission driven impact of trying to solve one of the biggest problems that the world faces, which is at the time more than 3 billion people not having access to any healthcare. Wow, man. It's, it's interesting to me uh, that you chose or, or that, that, that issue of healthcare stood out to you or you didn't have any background. You didn't have any medical background, right? No, not, no formal medical education, no medical background. So, dude, when did that pop into your head? Like, when were you like, healthcare? When, how did that happen, man? Because there could have been a thousand <laughs> other things you could have probably picked out that are needs to be. Obviously, healthcare is a huge one. But how did that happen, dude? I think it goes back to my childhood. And I've thought okay. about this a lot. Um, and on reflecting... I think it goes back to, you know, when I was about four or five years old and seeing my father struggle with cancer. Um, he had a very large tumor in his thigh uh, called liposarcoma. And I mean, that was a multi-year battle that ended up just financially devastating, health devastating, just the, the family. And that was very impressionable on me as a growing up where simultaneously my dad was going through radiation, but then was getting back in going to do the truck driving and getting to work providing for the family. Because if he didn't, we don't have food on the table. Yeah. And that healthcare aspect, I think stems from that childhood experience of, not wanting anyone to have to go through an experience like what my father experienced wow, and, and persevered through. Wow, dude. And, and so you identify this and there's the reason it's, it's the adversity that you and the family endured before. Right. And so it gives you this passion to identify this need you you got to unpack this for me, man. Yeah. Once that once that need was identified, what's the first step? Because this is huge. You took you're talking about you just you just took on a huge <laughs> problem. Yes. Where, where do you start with that, dude? Well, so that was the same question I asked myself, you know, many years ago: is how come this doesn't exist? Like from a technology perspective it's not too difficult i mean there are apps like skype and you know other tools to do video calls but why couldn't somebody just push a button and video call a doctor and so it started in that simple way of wow why does that not already exist and i was really surprised that it didn't and i decided uh maybe quite naively at the time that I was going to build a, a platform and I didn't think of this as some sort of company or some sort of business, but just build a platform to help try to empower bringing healthcare to people that don't have it just through, through video, which was the only way that, you know, doctors or patients could, could actually have that conversation because there's just not enough doctors mm -hmm. around the world mm -hmm. for, how much need there is. Mm -hmm. And even if there are a lot of doctors, say in a city urban environment, once you get into a rural, more remote environment where much of the population lives around the world, there's nothing there. Yeah. Yeah. What was the first step? So <laughs> first You've identified it. You have, now you have the idea we, we can, we can make, like you said, I think we can make this happen. You had the tech background to maybe build out a platform, at least get started building out a platform like that. What was the first step now? Yeah, so the first step was kind of going back to my training, which was bringing uh, the technology to play and building an initial prototype of that. And so I spent uh, 
a few weeks basically building out what I thought would be a version one prototype yeah. of a platform doing something very, very simple, allowing doctors to sign up, patients to sign up, and then basically having a video call through the platform in a secure encrypted way. Mm. And that <laughs> evolved substantially over the years, but what started as a, uh, really just a, a small prototype then led me down this whole big problem of healthcare is a big, big uh, challenge to try to overcome and bring to people. But um, step one was let's try to build that tech product to get people using it. Yeah. Yeah. And did you, the f version one, was it like, was it like on an app or was it on a, com like a desktop computer or how, how did, what did it look like? It looked terrible. Okay. <laughs> did it uh, work? It, it worked. It okay. worked. But it was, it was very basic, um, very straightforward. But the core objective for the app at the time was push a button, talk to a doctor. And did that first through a web uh, web app, but then, you know, over time uh, realized mobile first because – People didn't have desktop or laptop yeah. computer, mostly. Of course, some did, but uh, the majority of people were experiencing the internet for the first time through a mobile phone. Mm. And for me, that was something that the whole paradigm of how people were interacting with each other, whether socially, all through their phone first, it was a really interesting thing because people just jumped and leapfrogged to smartphones first rather than mm -hmm. going through this desktop, laptop, mm -hmm. smartphone. Like yeah. we did. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it was fascinating to see the creative ways that people were using technology, in this case smartphones, to transact business, to learn English, to get entertainment, and mm -hmm. everything that they were consuming from – really a lifestyle perspective was coming from that smartphone. It was fascinating to witness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now when you get version one up and you have the platform built out, I mean, what, what's up? H how do you get doctors to sign up for this thing? <laughs> and how do you put the word out yeah. to people? I mean, yeah. oh, you're yeah. just some dude in Asia, man. <laughs> exactly. And, and <laughs> that knows how to do technology. <laughs> That's it. I mean, no one knew who I was. Um, I didn't have some big network. I was starting from complete scratch. And after I had a, a prototype of an app that ended up building, now the big challenge was, how do we get people to use this? Because mm -hmm. you can have some great piece of technology. Not that version one was. It was pretty rough. But how do you get people to actually use it? So the mission of trying to make a small impact on bringing healthcare to people who don't have it could potentially be achieved. And so <laughs> basically uh, I didn't really know any other way. I just started cold calling and knocking on doors. Uh, and so at, at this time um, I had decided I wasn't really traveling anymore in Asia. I was mm -hmm. going to put some roots down and actually live. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, after about a year, I, I moved to Singapore kind of officially. Okay. <laughs> I, I had a mental shift of, I'm not traveling anymore. I'm actually living here. I get it. Yeah. Which, um, which was an interesting kind of personal development shift as well of now I need to figure out how to put roots down and it's a totally new environment. And at the same time, trying to get some doctors to, to use the platform mm -hmm. and literally just went door to door at, at the different hospitals and faced, you know, thousands of rejections. People thought it was pretty crazy. Um, and actually the adult age in Singapore at the time was uh, 21 years and I was only 20. So I was literally in their eyes, a kid yeah. coming in, trying to, <laughs> trying to get them to use a medical product, which, uh, you know, the medical has got high standards and needs to be, uh, you know, well developed and well thought out. That's so right. it was, a, <laughs> it was a big learning experience and uh, 
a big challenge and persistence and perseverance. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. No, I bet it was, man. And at what point did it start to get some traction, Justin, and you you started to realize, oh man, maybe maybe this is this is gonna happen. I mean, where was that shift, man? So it took a number of months um before we got a handful of doctors using it. Okay. And there were a couple that had faith that, uh, you know, I was, we were going to deliver on, on what we were talking about and this would be useful to them. And after a few months and we had a few initial users, um, we saw quite quickly that the feedback from the users was overwhelmingly positive in many cases, not only from the patient side, but also on the, the doctor side, it provided them flexibility and better ownership of how they practice medicine and really kind of opened up the doors of how they could really practice medicine in their own way, more freedom. And I was sitting in Singapore and I was reaching out to anybody and everybody who would <laughs> take a meeting or who would uh, listen about uh, this crazy idea of trying to bring healthcare to people around uh, Southeast Asia. And Online for the first time for ever. The first time. Yeah. <laughs> and it was after about five to six months of uh, just knocking on doors, trying to build out the users. Um, one of the, the gentlemen that I was talking with and, you know, trying to get advice from and just kind of build out a community in Singapore said, you know, this is pretty interesting. Have followed you the past, you know, few months. Seems like you've got a bit of hustle and, you know, pretty persistent. How about I invest in the business? And I was like, invest in a business. <laughs> <laughs> Am I even running a business at the moment? You know, I, wow, I man. didn't think about what I was doing as a business. It was just kind of a hobby project trying to just make an impact in whatever way I could. I didn't certainly didn't think of it as like a business that somebody would invest in at the time. Mm -hmm. You were bringing your skills to bear in order to help your fellow humans. That's yeah. it. Yeah. That's it. And at that point, that was a critical turning point where I said yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he he and a group of friends uh, ended up investing in the business and I learned a whole heck of a lot of stuff about how that worked. Um, had never gone through that before, of course, but it was one of those times where it turned from this is a hobby project to this is something much bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And this is a vessel through which could fulfill a greater mission and a greater purpose um, beyond just myself. And that was a huge turning point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did, uh, so that investment process, I, I know you weren't looking at it at that time as a business, but there had to be, there had to be a moment that you realized that like, um, okay, this is, this can be a legitimate way for me to make a living. Um, and was it, was it in that same moment where you, you had the investors come in or were you kind of thinking that beforehand? I didn't think about a company I started is called ring MD, but I didn't think about it at that moment as a way that I would make a living. Okay. It was more of, wow, this is a lot more resources that we can use to now hopefully have you know, bigger impact. Now we can get it going. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. And I mean, at the time I was, I had probably only like 15 to 20 possessions. It was a backpack and a laptop and some clothes. I mean, wow, dude. I was living a pretty minimalist life and I wasn't, I didn't need much to live, just yeah. some food and, <laughs> uh, you know, some clothes and a laptop. And, uh, for me, that's always been just kind of a sweet spot of just, keeping it simple, but focusing on the things that matter. And for me at the time, it was, how can we go out and even if it's a, a little bit crazy or a lot of crazy, try to solve some big problem and just make a dent at that. And so 
it was less about making a living and more about how do you make impact? What a mindset, dude. Yeah. I mean, what a mindset to go in and, and to tackle a problem as huge as this in order to purely out of a, a desire to fill a tremendous need within hum, within humanity. Uh, and then this guy comes along and says, let me invest this money. And you still, <laughs> yeah, still don't it, think, man, now I can make a living. Now I can have, you think, now we can make a difference. You're still really coming at it. Yeah, with such a pure perspective, man. What a freaking mindset, dude. Yeah, it was it was really fascinating. And, you know, for me, it was always about how can we take what we've been given and, you know, 3X that, 10X that, and, and do something bigger, even if you're blessed with something small. Like, how can we take that and magnify that? Mm-hmm. Be good stewards of, of the resources. My, my parents taught me that, and uh, they also embodied that <laughs> growing up. So that was a big value part of my value system that uh i think helped really keep things focused yeah especially when things got extremely difficult and there's no other reason to keep going even even if it were about money or about something else unless you have that higher purpose that higher mission when the times get tough I mean, how how do you keep going? <laughs> Amen to that. You know why this story fires me up so much, Justin, is because it's it's it parallels the story of Three of Seven Project yeah. and the creation of. Um, of course, we didn't have to take the risk of flying <laughs> over to Southeast Asia and starting literally from scratch in a country that we didn't know of and not knowing the language and not, like that that's a whole nother level but the mindset behind it it just really parallels our mindset when we started three of seven project and and you just there are other people who have done business this way but I think it's definitely um not the most common mindset that people go into business with. Mm-hmm. But if you can go into business with that mindset, man, there's a bigger mission. There's a bigger purpose. I mean, that's us. Our bigger purpose is sharing Jesus with people, Absolutely. right, and making an eternal impact. Um, and, and I told you earlier, that's the only thing that sustains me within now, three of seven project as a business, a way that we make our living is the ministry aspect. Yeah, that is the only thing that sustains me, man. That's why it's, I'm so just filled with joy to hear that your story parallels our yeah. story, and it gives me courage. It gives me, it strengthens me to hear that it worked for you, because uh, I think it's a, I think it's a great place to be, mm-hmm. and it, it really encourages me to hear that. Um. So Ring MD. Yes. When did you come up with the name? 2013. Okay. So experimented with a few other <laughs> names uh, in the early days again while it was just a uh, kind of a pet project and Ring MD was just the simplest part of the roots of literally call a doctor, talk to a doctor, ring a medical doctor mm-hmm. and that's uh yeah, that that became uh, the brand through which, you know, all of this uh, was able to be built out through and really the kind of the organization that allowed me the opportunity. And I'm super blessed and thankful that I was able to work on what I loved yeah. <laughs> while simultaneously um, getting to focus all my time on that. Was it harder to get the doctors to sign up or the patients to sign up? You would think it would be the doctors, but oh, you're you're spot on. Um, the thing with the the patients is that they had a real need. Uh-huh. There's no other option in many cases, whether it's price being an inhibitor, whether it be just location where they lived. Maybe there weren't that many doctors, and so they would have to take off work and travel, mm. you know, for a day or two, and then they're not earning income. And then they have to pay for, for a doctor. It was very prohibitive for millions and millions of people. Yeah. And for, for the more difficult aspect was definitely the doctors because for them, typically they had a pretty good 
life and uh-huh. made a pretty good living, whether or not they, you know, were providing online doctor consultations or not. Um, we learned very quickly that you had to align the interests. And so we would, after a number of months of so many trial and errors, um, we realized we started pitching this as a way to improve their business, to grow it. And so we, we first came out, Oh, come out, let's make an impact, do this. But that didn't really resonate with many people. Yeah. And so we flipped the script a bit and made it all about, we're providing a tool that can help you grow your business. And for them, you know, make more money, which for many cases, that was a big motivator. Whereas we were simultaneously fulfilling the mission by getting doctors aligned and getting them focused on what mattered to them mm-hmm. yeah, rather than what mattered to us as an organization. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> um, as you build this out and you have investors come in, uh, were there, were there partnerships formed? So was there a time that finally you had people around you that were also in alignment with the mission that then you guys could work together to really build this thing out? Yeah. So in the early days, um, investors came in and they injected a half a million dollars of capital. So that gave us a good amount of resources. I mean, at the time that was massive amounts of resources, had no idea how we were going to use all of that to, to grow the the organization. I mean, it was the most amount of money I've seen or heard in in my life um, at the time. And from that point on, that's where it got me thinking, okay, we, we have the mission part down. That's what motivates me, but we need to get the business and the organization side down because we're not a charity and not that charities are, are bad, but we wanted to do it in a sustainable way of where we're able to support the work and keep growing that so that it's not a, it's not just let's go make an impact for a year. It's how can we go make an impact for 10 years or 50 years or a hundred years potentially. Yeah. And so after receiving the investment that really made it a switch go off of this is a business. This is not just a hobby. We want to keep the core values and the mission front of mind Mm-hmm. But at the same time, we have to do that in a sustainable way and was very blessed that some of the first people we brought on board, some of the first uh, programmers and uh, designers and people touching and building the product um, were some of the most incredible people I've, I've ever met and had an honor and a joy to work with and still are very close with to this day after you know, almost a decade. And that's when things got real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How, how did you find those people to bring in? Yeah, it's really tough, but I got really good at just kind of dealing with people saying no and then just keep going. Mm-hmm. And so it was just a matter of putting myself out there. And even if I knew that nine out of 10 people I meet would think, okay, not really interesting or, you know, this isn't what I'm trying to trying to do the one out of 10 or the one out of 50 or one out of a hundred that I ended up meeting were people that truly had those shared values and yeah, were yeah. really inspired by the mission mm-hmm. rather than just trying to collect a paycheck. Mm-hmm. And for us, like, even though we had raised a decent amount of capital, we we're still keeping it very lean. You know, for me, I wasn't motivated by money. So it was just like, how do we run this operation as, tightly and as lean as possible because that's going to give us even more runway, even more time yeah. to be able to go out and build this into hopefully something that truly impacts mm-hmm. millions of people's lives, which at the time when, you know, we're, we're doing with a small amount of doctors and a small amount of users, that was the mindset that it was really important for us as an organization to keep front and center. And were you seeking, those so those part those programmers those partners that you brought in were you seeking them 
from the local community there in Singapore, or were you reaching back to the states to find those individuals? So, it was a it was a mix of both. Um, for for me, we ended up settling on building out the team locally because it just was so different. And for people building out the product and the platform, it's really important that they had a local perspective so that they could truly help create a product that actually met the needs of the communities. And I mean, before I, I went out to Southeast Asia, I had no idea how people lived out there. I had no idea the challenges that they faced or even the opportunities that came from having a smartphone access. And, and it was just a complete paradigm shift for me. So for, for us at the time, it was building out a local team okay. because they had a local understanding and also because it was where I was building out the community. It was where I was putting myself out there, trying to meet people, trying to not just be an outsider in the community, but truly come in and try to, you know, be respectful of the culture and ingrain myself in that. And the local team helped tremendously. Gotcha. Tremendously. Now, when you finished up, before I hit you with that question, you finished up with, as you brought those team members in, you've got your, you've got your investors, you've got your capital, and then it really takes off. Oh, yeah. What happened? Well, unpack that for me, man. <laughs> it gets real the moment somebody puts uh investment dollars in a, in a business. And, you know, this is uh, I mean, we could sit here for hours and, and talk about all the different trials and tribulations and lessons learned and all the, the mistakes made, mm -hmm. but it got real because now it was a business. Now there were people's livelihoods by working at ring MD where this had to work. I mean, this yeah, is, this is yeah. their livelihood. And so not that we weren't serious about doing it before, um, but it was only me. And so, you know, for me living out of a backpack, uh, you know, kind of backpacking around Southeast Asia and just keeping a minimalist lifestyle, that was great mm -hmm. for me at the time, but for others with, you know, wives and kids and, and had a different family dynamic, it became exponentially more important to, be intentional about how do we build the business side of this out so that we can keep all of this moving forward. And it got real very quickly because, well, especially investors, they didn't necessarily have the same impact driven motivation yeah, yeah. that we started as an early stage company that we were trying to make happen. They had some expectations. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it's not to say that financial investors don't care about the impact. There's some incredible investors out there that are very mission driven, very mission oriented around the types of companies that they back. But I mean, realistically, anyone who's investing capital in the business is looking typically for some sort of ROI. Uh, if not, you would just make a donation. That's right. Yeah, that's right. So I mean, by nature, that is their business. And very quickly, that kind of clash of cultures, less about you know, Singaporean culture, but more about an investment-minded culture paired with a, a very mission-driven, mission-first mm -hmm. culture, very quickly started to butt heads a little bit of how, how does that work? How do you prioritize that? And you've got people that have given you money and they're expecting a return. And you're sitting here thinking, hey, I want to build this out over the next, you know, 10, 15, 20 years. I'm not thinking about cashing out or, you know, doing some sort of, you know, exiting the business or anything like that. But very quickly, uh, that became an important factor that we had to start addressing. Yeah. So to address that, you, do you just start doubling down and bringing those team members in and really start pushing for that growth on a much shorter in, within a much shorter time frame than you had initially set when it was just you. I mean, Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. You, I mean, you, you have to, it's, mm -hmm. um, it's the nature of, uh, the kind of investment game, especially in the tech startup community is 
it's all about how fast can you grow? Yeah. So you're growing, yeah. you know, you're, you're doubling every six months, 12 months. Well, how do you triple or quadruple? You know, Holy it's, it's smokes, always, man. it's always pushing for, for more, which is fine. I think, uh, you know, growth is awesome and having very big goals of trying to do that. But how many hours were you putting in? Uh, I was not sleeping much. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean to interrupt you, but yeah. you're talking about even doubling in that short amount of time and then tripling or quadrupling. I'm like, holy smokes, man. It's just, yeah, I mean, it's it's almost unrealistic expectations, but, and not to, not to talk bad about, you know, investment as a, as a profession or as a, something that people do. It's an amazing thing. It makes the world go around, Yeah, but there's no downside for them to want to push and say, Oh, how do you move faster? How do you grow faster? They're not the ones in the arena, you know, putting in the 16, 18, 20 hour days, (laughs) you know, at minimum six days, but many times seven days a week, nonstop. And, you know, when you have that mission component, it fuels that Mm. and it keeps going. But there's always that tough dynamic sometimes of, of balancing of you don't want to also be too focused on on that at the expense of you know the fundamentals and keeping the business going but at the same time always sticking true to that even in the face of a lot of external pressure and there was a lot of external pressure from the investors that uh, we brought on board and it was really tough. Some really, really tough conversations, some really, really difficult times. Um, because there was that conflict between one side wanting to solely make an ROI on investment, but at the same time, this desire on, uh, on my side and on our company side of, well, we have 3 billion people around the world that have no access to healthcare. And there are some people working on that, but so much more that we can do as a, as a community. Yeah. Can you think of a, during that time of substantial growth, as it, as it really took off, as you described it, can you think of a, maybe your, for you personally, the number one challenge that you encountered as specific, specifically in maybe how you overcame it? I know you said there's hours and hours of conversation, but maybe one that just stands out to you that we could pass along to the listeners, man. I think one of the big things was staying focused on what matters, even mm. when the world and everything around you is suggesting that you should do otherwise. Um, like, for example, really prioritizing the mission was something that was critical to why I started ring MD and not to dwell too much on, you know, the kind of an investor situation. Um, but that was not a big priority. And even in the face of that, in the face of, you know, threats of, you know, lawsuits, threats of everything, um, you know, threats of, Hey, well give us the money back. And, you know, these sorts of scenarios and, it becomes really, really tough sometimes to stay laser focused on that mission when everything around you is telling you, are you must be doing something, you know, you're doing something crazy or not normal because you're focused so much on that. And I mean, there was a time of where it was one of the toughest decisions I've, I've ever made. And I got the team together and a group of the investors gave me an ultimatum and said, you're not running it the way, you know, we, we want to only focus on the profits and the kind of back end story to that was we were giving the platform away for free in some instances in the emerging market environments because there was such a need and we wanted to build up a user base. Yeah. Yeah. And also it, it felt in a way wrong to try to monetize people who really there was no other way to get access to healthcare. And we just assumed we'll figure out how to, you know, get the economics and of the business, right. But we should do the right thing, which is even if it's not making us money, we should still allow use of the platform because there's no other way that they could get access. And 
it wasn't a hundred percent. We weren't just giving everything away for free, but a lot of the investors were trying to shift the focus away from that aspect and say, only focus on the markets and the countries where people can pay and totally ignore this side of the business. And for me, that just didn't seem right. I mean, we had thousands of users that were using our platform. Yes, they weren't paying, but it also wasn't costing us much more than, you know, some time and supporting the platform because, I mean, that's the way software businesses work. You know, you, you build it once and, you know, people can use it many, many times and the cost is lower each time traditionally. And eventually there was an ultimatum to say, if you don't stop this, like, basically we're going to create a lot of problems. And serious I, pressure. Yeah, serious pressure. And, you know, they also, uh, I was about 21 at the time. So, you know, that I was a foreigner. So they thought, you know, perhaps mm -hmm. we can apply some pressure and we can try to control, you know, the way the business is going, which, you know, fair enough, that was their perspective. But for some crazy reason, I pulled the team together, transparently said, hey, here's what's going on. It's, um, I don't think there's a way forward other than us giving and buying out um, some of these investors. And it wasn't everybody. There was a couple people that were really being kind of a, a difficult um, shareholder. Squeaky wheels. Uh, to say the least. <laughs> <laughs> very polite way to say it. And um, I pulled the team together. There was about 12 of us at the time. And I said, this is what's going on. And we're going to have to buy them out. And that's going to affect each and every one of us because we're going to have to give a lot of the cash that we raised back to buy these investors out because if they keep staying in, First of all, they don't want to stay in anymore. And it just came at a, a situation of where there was so much uh, kind of butting heads that it it had to be one way or the other. And so I pulled the team aside, said, this is what's happening. Um, there's two options here. One, we can keep dealing with this. We can keep moving forward. We keep these investors in, but realistically – it's not going to get better. I mean, it's it's very clear. There's Unless you compromised on your values. Absolutely. Yeah. Or it's going to be extremely tough, but we, we give a big chunk of the cash that we have back and we keep, we keep rolling. We keep giving this a go. There's something really interesting here. The early reactions and the early users, we're making real impact. And the stories that were coming from Indonesia and the Philippines of, you know, people who had never spoken to a doctor in their life using RingMD to have the opportunity to get health care for the first time in their life. And it, it was too important to abandon that, even though it would have been a lot easier, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and so brought the team aside, and I'd already pretty much made the decision that we had to deal with the situation, but I wanted to put the options on the table for the team. Also to see like really who, who's fully on board with what we're doing. Who's, who's on here, not because we're paying them a paycheck, not because it's easy or fun or a nice tech challenge, but who really wants to be here? So I pulled the team aside and everybody said, you know what? Like, let's let's give this a go. It's going to be really hard, but let's give it a go. All of them? All Every of them. single one. Man. And I was very fortunate that uh, the team stuck by because then that led to a scenario of where we gave a lot of the cash back and, you know, the we had hired a bunch more people than we could afford for the revenue that was coming in because we had the investment capital and it was going to be a, a really big hustle to make it work. And the next couple of weeks we got after it and people took pay cuts and, you know, it led to a very, very difficult time of 
just having to have a lot of faith and a lot of uh, just trusting the process that sticking by the values that, that matter and not compromising on that. Um, and yeah, that period of time uh, was about 15 months before uh, we were able to fully resolve that problem. Even after we gave um, a lot of the investment back, the investors kept causing problems, kept bringing stuff, because they wanted more. They wanted more. Um, Because the company was worth more than it was when they put the Uh investment in. And so that was a 15-month period of where, for much of that, most of the people took barely livable kind of salaries because they believed in, in that mission. And it was one of the most humbling periods of my life, but it also showed me in a weird sort of way that even though it was completely uncertain, even though there was no guarantee that it would work out. And even though it was kind of crazy at the time to, to do that, sticking by what I valued and what we as an organization valued the mission overall. It, um, even if it didn't work out, even if it failed, I'm glad that, you know, I would have been glad that we made that decision because yeah. we didn't compromise. Yeah. Even though it would have been a lot easier at the time. Yeah. Man. That's some strength that's at 21 years old, yeah, man. That's what I'm sitting there. That thinking. many people's livelihood riding on your shoulders. You're dealing with this, um, these large amounts of money, these law lawsuits and this back and forth. That's a lot. That had to have been a stressful time, man. When you, t- you think about, you know, we talk a lot about leading in the absence of orders. They, and, and you don't have any experience to fall back on there. It's like, no, you just got to make – the best decision you know how to make. And if it's wrong, it's wrong and adjust later. But yeah. Yeah. The amazing, the, the, the I think that my biggest takeaway from that though, is we talk about, yeah, that's gotta be a stressful time, but man, staying focused on that, the value of the mission and the people that you were helping. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously that's, that was the essential comp- component of getting through that. Yeah, I mean, it was uh, it was that, and also you know, faith in God and a mm-hmm. faith in you know things beyond myself, and yeah. you know, not not the things of this world. I mean, there's literally no other way <laughs> that yeah, yeah. could even have survived, um, you know, personally anything like that. But so you know, thankfully by the grace of God, you know, got through that and many other challenging periods. But you know, it it made it very very real of what it means to not compromise, you know, because, and it's, of course, that's something that is a very obvious kind of situation of where it's, it's a much bigger deal, but that taught me a very big lesson of even in the small things, like, what are we compromising on? You know, what are the small things we are? Because if we can't compromise, if we're compromising on the small or we're, we're not being intentional about the small things in those big moments, how can we be, mm. you know, intentional in those moments? And that was a very big learning experience of no matter what, even if there's complete uncertainty, just keeping the faith and, you know, sometimes uh, just jumping forward in faith and, and seeing what happens. Yeah. And thankfully, uh, thankfully that turned out, uh, we got through that and, you know, got back to the mission. That's right. Well, <sighs> I appreciate you sharing that story with us, Justin. That was that's powerful, man. Yeah. Especially for I mean, so many entrepreneurs that are out here listening to this. Uh, just some powerful lessons learned in that story, wrapped up in that story. I love that, man. It's, it encourages the crap out of me, mm-hmm. dude. Um, where does where does ultimately where does Ring MD end up going? Yeah, so... And if I miss anything in between, feel free to fill it in, but... Uh, we... <laughs> I mean, we anything get, that you want to... Yeah, anything sure. that's on your heart, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, no, f- for sure. I mean, that's, you know, one one example of dozens of things of, you know, the challenges don't get easier, 
they actually just get bigger and you know as a as an individual you just have to get stronger to to be able to to face those and you know it's when you look at moments like that it that became an important part of the culture that we developed as an organization is no matter what even if it doesn't make us money we're going to do good mission driven work now we want to we're a business but we're never going to compromise on that mm-hmm. and it actually gave this super strong conviction that that is 100% the path that we have to take and never question that again even if it didn't make financial sense for us we have to accomplish the mission in that way and so moving forward um you know fast forwarding a, a few years <laughs> and a whole heck of a lot of challenges later yeah we we grew we had operations in more than 12 countries uh, predominantly in southeast asia and at our peak uh more than 300 full-time uh, equivalents all across uh, southeast asia and there was a lot of learning experiences uh, a lot of really just uh interesting challenges but also really just fascinating and humbling service that uh that just kept us going i mean the ability to actually have a small impact on somebody's life and something as simple as just getting health care and almost half of the users that ever use ring md were experiencing health care for the first time in their lives out of yeah. millions of people that use the platform almost half spoke to a doctor for the first time man that's unbelievable dude it's americans can't believe that yeah no it's 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 super humbling and but that's what kept us going yeah you know like that that was the why yep now um at, at you you mentioned at the peak at the peak of this how many users did did, is, did you ever track how many users you, you guys had at, at oh yeah what was that what what did that get up to yeah so over uh, more than 5 years we had more than 12 million people wow. use the platform Dang. to get access to healthcare holy smokes man mm-hmm. yeah and um it was really humbling we got the opportunity to work with a lot of really great hospitals great healthcare groups um um even today many of the national level implementations for example in india are still running um that had the five-year anniversary um just just about a month and a half ago of having a national telemedicine platform and of course since uh you know covid Uh um and you know all all the different dynamics that happened uh last year when there was so much uncertainty and you know people weren't sure what was happening you saw a huge surge of people having even in the U S yeah. and places where we are blessed to have healthcare technology became essentially the only option that people could access healthcare. And so what's really interesting to observe is that there was a lot of, a lot more innovation happening in places like Southeast Asia in healthcare because there wasn't the ability to just drive down the road five minutes and walk into a clinic or drive to a hospital they had to innovate because there's no other option Mm -hmm. so yeah we're super blessed that we got to work with some really great organizations um and yeah we phenomenal learning experience and very humbling to be able to play a small role in uh, millions of people's lives yeah so was there was there a point what ring md today where is where is it at? Was there a point that you exited, Justin, or or how how did that happen, man? Yeah, that's um, that's a whole whole uh, different story there. Uh, a lot of lot of things to potentially unpack there, but yeah, in, in um, late 2018 um, to early 2019, uh, I actually sold a majority stake in RingMD to a group based out of Boston, and that was um, a really interesting transition period for me personally, kind of seeing, uh, you know, after about seven years of, of building out um, what was almost like a, a this your baby, a, a baby. Yeah, yeah. A baby for me. Um, but seeing the company kind of go to the next stage and, you know, really 
bringing in some other financial partners that could take it even further from an impact perspective. And yeah, there's a whole lot that went into that decision, but really it came down to what's best for achieving that mission and, uh, and really taking the company to, to another level. That had to be tough, man. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> you, you just, just from, from you personally, uh, from a, from a mindset or, or, or whatever perspective you want to give us when you do sell that majority portion of something that was your idea and that you bootstrapped to get going. Yeah. I mean, how'd you work through that brother? You know, for, for me at the time it was, how do we take this and really 10 X this and, we were doing a ton of work in Asia, but wanted it to be a truly global company. And so bringing on some of the financial partners that we did out of Boston allowed us the opportunity to take the company to another level Yeah, and impact hopefully, you know, more, more people. And so it was really, for me, it was bittersweet in many ways. Yeah. Um, it was certainly a good, situation and the company is in really great hands and I spent um, the better part of uh, almost two years transitioning the company and still being active on the board and you know a very advisory and strategic kind of role Mm -hmm. but um, you know for me it was recognizing my strengths and recognizing kind of where I wanted to play and also recognizing where there were gaps and needing to bring in some of those uh, different partners to help augment that and, mm-hmm. and take it to another level. Yeah. So it was bittersweet, um, good in many ways, and it was really great in many ways. But uh, at the same time, it was, it was tough. Even though I knew it was the right decision, it was really tough to, uh, to do that because, you know, it is that, that yeah. your, your baby in a lot of ways. Yeah, and, yeah. But I, I felt called to, you know, go go beyond that and uh, go try to work on uh, other things that uh, were pertinent as well beyond just uh, healthcare. That's right. Yeah. So you feel at peace with it right now? Absolutely. Okay. Now, absolutely. Um, yeah. Shortly after was, you know, bittersweet, but uh, now 100% at peace and it was definitely the right decision. Awesome. All right, I want to take a quick break, and then I want to dig in a little more into that transition. What ha- what when you get back to the states? Yeah, yeah. What that looks like settling into this new life. You've just sold that company. I imagine your that changed your life financially. Now you you have you have some capital. What are the other things you decided to explore? What are the other things you're pursuing? What is your new mission? I want to hear all of this. So all right. let's let's, uh, let's take a quick break and then we'll dig into that stuff. Thanks, brother. Thank you. Finally getting to learn about Justin Fulcher. Man. I know it. This is this is groundbreaking for the world. Finally getting to a little know a little bit more about him. Is this story out anywhere else? <laughs> I love it, man. That's some amazing stuff. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, that's... Dang it. Yes, it's been a wild life, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> you got the gray hair to prove it, too. You can see it in the sunlight, actually. Encouraging and challenging, even with the, you know the things that we're doing here. I mean, like Chad said, that I see a lot of similarities and staying on the mission and you know not worrying about where anything's going to come from and the relying on God and yeah, the way to do it. Man. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. Like in all of that, I mean, the biggest takeaway was I think it's like time well spent. Really. situation there's nothing you can do mm-hmm. 
it was so obvious. Like, it was such a crazy scenario where the only way was <laughs> yeah. one. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. And it was, it was really faith-building. I mean, there's dozens of moments like that. Yeah. But it works in mysterious ways. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we love it. <laughs> you said 12 million users? Yeah, more than 12 million fake accounts. Sound all right? Sound good oh yeah, sounds you? great. Yeah, you got a radio voice. Do I? Oh yeah. <laughs> we finally, finally got him to pony up on that mic, man. <laughs> We're back. We're back, guys. We're back from the break. Um, finally, we just we were cutting up on the break. Said finally getting to learn now who Justin Fulcher is, and you know, man, just up to this point, uh, thinking through what you have done it's just it's it's just insane dude and what what you have done and he's only 28 yeah it, this with you know that early in life it's just blows my mind brother i mean that's a lot if somebody came to me and they were 60 years old and they were like this is what i did in my life i've been working yeah that's a You're lifetime worth of work man uh um I don't know, man. Lot, lot of value in there for any entrepreneur that's listening to this. So, uh, I want to, dude. What's up with the Forbes thing? Because here's the thing: you don't know this, but me and Blake, we've done, we've looked into you, Justin. Because we, we said, when, like I say, when we first met you, we were like, "There's something about this dude. He's not telling us everything. There's something about this dude." And and, and we did a little research yeah. on on brother Justin Fulcher. We was driving back from the basic course, and we was like, man, Justin was a cool guy. What did he tell you? And everybody's like, ah, he didn't really tell me that much. And we was like, let's Google him because he did some stuff. Let's see what he's all yeah. about. And Blake calls me like a day later. He said, you know this guy was on Forbes, right? You know, <laughs> what's up? What was up with that, brother? Well, you know, as part of trying to get the message out and get the, the mission out, we were very blessed that, you know, we had a number of, journalists and uh different people interested in the story and so yeah was uh was uh asked to be on uh the forbes 30 under 30 list uh a couple years a few years back and uh wow time flies but um yeah it was just uh just happened to be as part of how we were trying to get the message out and trying to raise awareness for some of the stuff we were doing um i never really I mean, I, I'm not really one to want to pursue press or pursue that aspect. Um, it's just not really interesting. And I think in many ways for what we were trying to do could have potentially been a distraction. Mm. It's easy to get caught up in that. Not that there's anything wrong with it, but for me, it was never something it really did. But um, there were some strategic moments where it made sense when people reached out that, you know, we gave those interviews and, and had that. So very honored and humbled to to be on lists like that. Um, what does that thirty under thirty mean, Justin? I guess it's the thirty people under thirty to watch around the world. Okay, so they pick. Is that is that like a yearly thing that they do? That's a yearly thing. Yeah. Man, what an accomplishment, brother! <laughs> Top thirty. Top in the thirty world. in the world. Uh, I don't know about that. Under <laughs> thirty to watch what's going on, man. Uh, I I just thought that was really cool because yeah. when you see when you see an article pop up. Uh, from a magazine like Forbes, like that carries some weight. Yeah, they're they're not just they're not just seeking out your your old your old guy. <laughs> you know that carries yeah. a little weight behind it. So that caught yeah. our attention. That was that was really cool, man. Um, okay, that was fun. I wanna I wanna talk about I wanna talk about this transitional part of your journey real quick. Um. What, when did you finally get back to the States? So I moved back to the States in uh, 2019. So about two years ago. And the first year was really heavy on kind of transitioning the company. Um, The headquarters shifted to Boston 
from Singapore of the company and really trying to build it out into something more than just a Southeast Asia focused company yeah, and more into something more, more global. And so I moved back to the States in 2019 and it was really interesting having spent, you know, almost 10 years uh, at that point outside of the U S and of course had come back, you know, many, many times over the years, but coming back and actually living in the U S cause up to that point, my entire adult life was spent uh, in Southeast Asia. So was really focused on kind of the transition to the new management team. But then it was an opportunity of can kind of focus on almost anything right now. Like it was a real kind of introspective period of I never had to think about those questions for, for years because I was laser focused on ring MD. That's it. Yeah. That was what I focused on. That was the living, breathing, uh, kind of every aspect of my life was uh, not every aspect of the life, but from my career and kind of work and what I was putting into was all around growing ring MD and, you know, had a ton of ups and downs and, you know, tons of challenges and learning opportunities. And it was an amazing experience, but now it's, what's next. Yeah. And it was a really introspective and kind of reflective period of life for a period after that of what do I actually want to be doing? What do I want to spend time doing? And that led me to kind of explore a lot of uh, different areas that I wanted to kind of get back into that I'd kind of neglected. One of those was getting back outdoors Mm -hmm. a lot more and, um, kind of getting back and focusing on the physical training and, and getting more in line of that more kind of balanced aspect rather than just kind of almost singularly focused, which uh, is important when you're on a on a mission to be very focused. But at the same time, it was a different transition phase for me. So really getting down to the fundamentals of what did I actually want to do and what's kind of the next phase of life for me. Yeah. Yeah. And as you, as you really work your way completely out of it, and I don't know if you're complete, I'm sure ring MD is still gonna, you, you still, do you still have any, do you have any communication with them at all now? Um, I'm still on the board. Okay. So, so you, you still, you, you're still there in some capacity, but when you work your way, you know, to where okay, this is no long like this is yeah. just something that I'm this I, I'm here because I can contribute to it still, but I've got all this other life ahead of me. What does your day to day start to look like, man? What are you putting your time into? Like, I got back to basics, and you know it was really at first I was kind of almost at a loss of. I had so much of my time every single day filled up with nonstop kind of action around growing a businesses, the ups and downs of that. And then it was a lot less of that it still was there, but a whole lot less. And I really just used that as an opportunity to get back to basics. And so I could wake up and do almost, I was very blessed to, I could essentially get up and focus on whatever I wanted to, if I wanted to, go outdoors and uh, do some physical training out there or, you know, read and learn and sharpen the mind around, you know, some new area I'm interested in. It was wide open in many ways. And so simultaneously use that time back in the States to get back and kind of spend a lot more time with family as well um, for almost a decade, you know, living yeah. thousands of miles away. Um, use that time. My two younger sisters, grew up uh, very quickly uh, from after I left. And so kind of reconnecting, not that we lost touch, but just Mm -hmm. really being intentional about thinking my parents and my sisters and being intentional about those relationships. And um, yeah, simultaneously uh, got married as well. Mm -hmm. So kind of putting the foundations in place for the next phase of, you know, my life as, you know, a husband, but then, you know, in the future, a, a father and, 
kind of the what's the next phase of life and what's the next mission. Mm -hmm. So it was really doing a lot of exploration, um, spending, you know, a month uh, learning about, uh, say, um, you know, like how do rockets work and what's the future of space and, you know, what's, what's the current state of technology there. I also got a lot back into the nuts and bolts of the tech as well because I got kind of disconnected from the day-to-day of that as start growing uh, the company. And so I, I just got the opportunity to really dig in and explore and just learn. And it was, it was really almost like starting from day one again and, and having that opportunity of yeah, what's the next mission. Yeah. I love that you're referring to this stage in your life uh, over and over again as opportunity, right? Because it could have just as easily been an extremely difficult season of life for you. Not that there, not that you didn't face challenges in your day to day once you kind of moved out of that ring MD arena. But you know, I see a lot of a lot of high performing, intelligent individuals transition out of the SEAL teams. Just for one instance, right? And it's to- it totally destroys them, and it's simply a mindset thing of saying, oh, wow, I now get to start over, and this is an opportunity for me to um, not only uh, become a more well-rounded person, yeah. but, uh, but also an a opportunity to explore different aspects that I haven't had time to dig into. And, man, what a, what a great place to be to say, all right, man, I did this awesome thing. It's over now. Now I have this opportunity ahead of me to do whatever, man. That's a that's a yeah. that's a whole nother mindset, right? Well, you're right. And the first few months it was very tough. Um, you when you go from that kind of high intensity every single day you know, pulling the 12, 14, 16 hour, however many hours of just doing the reps, doing the work. And then all of a sudden the pace just drops substantially. There, there was a bit of a, at first, a feeling of like, there's a, an em- emptiness there around what's next. Yeah, And it was a tough time for a couple months there, but how I focused on, overcoming that was this is an opportunity to essentially redefine what I want to to focus on and what I want to explore. And I'm super blessed that I have the opportunity to really take a step back and at a later stage in life with more of a perspective and a lot of lessons learned, be intentional about what's the next phase. And for me, um, how I was grounded in that area was just focusing on the fundamentals uh, with the family, with the health, the physical fitness, Mm -hmm. getting back into nature, getting back into what was real and what was, Mm -hmm. you know, a a tangible thing where you had that opportunity to, to really explore. Mm -hmm. This totally resonates with me, man. Uh, That's another thing, not only viewing it as an opportunity, but taking, uh, taking a, some time to get back to the fundamentals, again, of who you are and what's important outside of this massive accomplishment that you have created and developed. For me, that was when I transitioned from the SEAL teams, I did the exact same thing you did. Let me get back to the fundamentals real quick of who I am. And that's what I did. I spent a whole summer cutting grass. That's awesome. Pulling weeds and flower beds, mulching, landscaping. Spent a whole summer. It was just me, that old black Toyota truck that's out there, a trailer, and a lawnmower. That's amazing. That's all it was, man. And I think this is an important step in anybody that's transitioning from a high level of whatever it is, business, military service, um, law enforcement, any any high level, you know, position, 
then now you're you're out of it. I think this is a very important building block of your transition. It's going back to those fundamentals of who you are, man. What's well, a reset? It's like yeah. out on the range today. After you finished a rep, you had to go back to the high ready. You yeah. know, before you started it. So now that you're out of the mix of it. Yeah, absolutely. It wasn't natural at first, but it was something that I'm very glad that happened because without taking a step back, it would have been very tempting to just jump into the next thing. Yeah. It's really easy to be focused on what's next, what's next, what's next. And, you know, I'm, I'm uh, totally guilty of, you know, focusing on, you know, what's next, what's next. I, I need that next challenge, but I made a commitment to myself at the time of spending one year of being intentional no matter what, wow, okay. of just being super intentional around, I don't have to just go, go, go on on that aspect of things. I need to take a step back. I need to take a reset, get realigned on what really matters mm -hmm. to me as, a, as an individual. And uh, there were certain areas where I neglected that, you know, around some of the family piece and, uh, you know, being laser focused on the business you don't, we all have 24 hours in a day and yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's not easy to, uh, to keep all the, the priorities in line. And so for me, it was one year of being intentional and, uh, doing a lot of exploration and focusing on the fundamentals. What, what that, after that, that, so that one year, was that 2019? That was uh 2020, 2020. No kidding, man. So yeah. the basic course, was that a part of that? For you, going back to the fundamentals? For for me, the physical aspect and, like, going back to the fundamentals, that was part of that. That's so cool, man. I, I, I freaking love that. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, where has that led you? Where has that led you? And I know, I, I mean, I don't know if you know what your next mission is, what your <laughs> next purpose is. Where has it led you? It's, it's led me to a lot of very different uh, kind of uh, – places and opportunities and, you know, putting things in front of me that are not things I would have imagined, but just being open to what actually is out there. And I've been blessed to over the past, you know, year have helped out with friends, different projects, uh, everything from oil rigs to, um, you know, helping out with safety on oil rigs to, you know, helping especially once the COVID-19 uh, pandemic started breaking out, helping different uh, Ministry of Health um, departments, especially uh, in emerging markets, quickly react to get their tech in place and go from kind of zero to 100 on uh, responding to what was a tremendous period of uncertainty for many people. And, you know, thankfully, uh, you know, many countries were able to, to respond and you know serve the needs of their citizens in that way. And it could have been a whole lot worse. Um, so being able to be in a position to spend time uh, helping out on different things, it's led to a whole lot of random places I never would have imagined <laughs> going or spending time. But I feel like that's given me a lot broader of a perspective where I was I was super focused on kind of healthcare and technology, but in that year, it's led me to you know, rural Alaska and, uh, you know, to different countries and different places that I'd never been and new challenges, which, uh, has been phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I'm very, very blessed and thankful. Oh, by the way, without going into much detail, uh, we were on the range today and Justin had to step away and put a suit on and do a little call with some really important people. He's he's into he's into some some high level uh some high levels of service. And uh I I, I asked Justin when he, he comes back down the range, I'm he's like, Man, I'm sorry about stepping out, man, you know, and this and that. I'm like, hey man, no big deal. I get it. I mean you you gotta you gotta work. You gotta get stuff done in order to be able to come out here and do fun stuff like this. He's like Oh no no this is this was just um I was just, I was just helping out you know <laughs> I'm not getting paid for this I'm just helping out and I was like oh okay that's that's awesome dude um would you say because now it seems like a lot of the stuff you're doing 
is uh, within the realm of serving and and helping, like which was really the initial mission of Ring MD. So has that mission now carried now into this portion of your life where you it sounds like you do have the freedom to serve and to help in a capacity where now there doesn't have to be any investors involved. There doesn't have to be anyone that that is holding anything over Justin's head. Mm -hmm. Is that part of your new mission, you think, at least in this season? Oh, absolutely. I think um, I'm tremendously blessed to be able to give back in in, uh, public service in a variety of different ways. And I think... What was really interesting to witness and is an interesting phase of life that I'm looking forward to explore more is where America's place in the world is and how, you know, across the the globe, there's so much competition and so much change happening. And I feel like there's a big need for many people across America to kind of step up and, and give back to our community and give back to I mean, we've been incredibly blessed to have been born in the U.S., and Mm -hmm. it's a phenomenal, um, amazing country. But at the same time, we can't get complacent as a as a society. And so, for me, it's how can I now that I'm back in the U.S. How can I take some of those lessons learned and take some of those kind of unique skills or unique opportunities that I've had the you know fortunate blessing to have experienced and really give back to try to solve some of the problems here in America and, Mm -hmm. and, and also try to create opportunities where in the world today, there's a lot of focus on kind of negativity and a lot of focus on, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty, but at the same time, it's in these moments where uh, as a country, we have the opportunity to kind of reinvent ourselves too, and kind of reset and, and focus on kind of getting back to those core values and getting back to the core mission and, uh, and doing that. So, I hope to serve in a, a small way and whatever way that that ends up being. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I couldn't imagine, I mean, we none of us saw what was coming in 2020 with the, the coronavirus and all that. And gosh, dude, what an environment that created Totally for you to be able to step up to the plate and, like you said, give back um, and share those hard earned lessons learned with with people here now in your own nation i could only imagine if it wouldn't have been for coronavirus your 2020 probably would have looked a lot different would you would you say that (laughs) totally different um yeah i spent a lot of 2020 of course uh i i tried to be intentional about not focusing on healthcare technology but uh uh (laughs) You were called to the plate, right? It had a lot different plans. Uh, God had a lot different plans uh, for me in terms of kind of using the years of kind of trials and tribulations and, you know, just getting, overcoming some of that, those challenges to understand like, how do you respond Mm -hmm. using technology and how do you have to quickly adapt to bringing healthcare, even here in the U S where once, uh, quarantine started happening and lockdown started happening where people were missing out on critical care because they couldn't go to the doctor because they weren't sure what was going on back uh, in the early parts of last year. Yeah. So what's been the most gratifying part or the most gratifying thing you've been able to, to do in 2020 in, in this environment, what's filled you up the most? There's been a, a lot of different things, but one of the biggest ones has been able to help a few Native American tribes here in the U.S. that when they were struck with uh, the lockdowns and they didn't have access to the care that they normally had to help them quickly put some technology solutions in place and be able to serve their population in that way because... They had no other option. And it was really interesting to be back in America as a reminder that there's actually 
a lot of people, although we're extremely blessed, there's a lot of people here in the U S where it's still medically underserved and it's led me to rural Alaska to, you know, very remote parts of Mississippi and, Mm -hmm. you know, across uh, the Midwest where you have working with some of the native American tribes to help them get healthcare and respond with the technology when there wasn't any other way at the time. So that was one of many, many fulfilling things uh, that I was blessed with last year. That's really cool, man. It's like you're, yeah. you're still now, you're now you're fulfilling what God created you to do, but now you're, you're continuing that, but now on your own home turf. Yeah. I love it. It's, you it's you bet you never saw that coming, did you? I a hundred percent zero <laughs> idea that I would be doing that in 2020, but, uh, it's in a weird way. I'm extremely thankful because, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a big way that I could thankfully give back in yeah. a, a time of uncertainty for yeah. many people. Do you think you'll ever go back into business? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. What are, what are some ideas? What are some prospects that you, that you have? I got a lot of crazy ideas now. Um, <laughs> Give me some that that you get you can that 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 other people can hear about. I know you got some stuff on the wraps. I know you do. <laughs> but what is some stuff? What's some stuff floating around in your head that um, that you see business wise in the future? I don't know about business wise yet, but one area I'm really excited about is the future of space and like space travel. And if we look back to, you know, the 1950s, the 1960s, and we look at one of the most innovative eras in American history was really going back to that kind of post-World War II space race generation of so many thousands of different modern technologies that we use today. So many of those stemmed from the space race back in the 50s and the 60s and and the 70s. And for me, I think... um, I'm not sure about a a business associated with that and what that looks like, but I'm really fascinated with um, some of the work that's being done with uh, launching thousands of satellites in uh, near earth orbit to provide internet to the whole world. Um, For example, Elon Musk, uh, Starlink is doing some incredible work uh, there, but I feel like we're just scratching the surface of how we can use uh, kind of a, space race 2.0 potentially, Mm -hmm. or, you know, a a revitalization of uh, space, which I don't know why, but just ever since I was very young, I've been fascinated with, uh, with that. Um, I mean, God's creation is incredible. So uh, I've I've always been drawn to to that, but um, not sure how that turns out to a business. Mm -hmm. Um, I I have some ideas, but uh, I'm really fascinated with that aspect, learning a lot about it and trying to, uh, see where I could potentially contribute to that. There's some passion there. Well, Definitely. the common thread that I like is that there's nothing too big. Like you got, oh, you, you go over to, to Southeast Asia and you say, and these jokers, they ain't got no health care. I'm fixing to get these cats some health care. Then you come back and you're like, well, one month I studied on how to get rockets up in space. And now I think I'm about to start another space race here in America. And, Justin it, is a daggone visionary, son. And you're serious about it. You know, said, I can see this. I'm glad we got you on the podcast. First, <laughs> first time podcast. Oh, yeah. but this is the first place you've heard Justin Fulcher. First, going to be the future face, uh, space race starter. Because he's got 40 or 50 years left to play. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. That, there ain't no telling what's about to happen, son. Well, thank you. But that's encouraging to see... You know, that's your passion, that's your mission, and and you're not letting, man, space is a big thing. I don't know how I'm going to figure this out. I don't know what the business is going to look like, and you're just going to pursue it. So That's, that's just, what he did with Ring MD. I know, that's what I'm saying. He's already done it once, and you know he's about to do it again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, dude. You know, it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't make me want to change what we are doing with 307 Project, but for me, it gives me a perspective on a whole different view mm-hmm. point. You are truly looking at the, we would call in the SEAL teams, 
the 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 battlefield picture like you're seeing an image uh, you're 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 a visionary you're able to look at huge issues huge opportunities right we i think specialize more in I, I, it, it's it's different very small smaller scale individual impact not that you you make individual impact after looking at this huge picture right it's just a to me it's a gives me insight into oh there's a whole nother realm of perspective well, yeah, that justin sees the world through yeah. it's you know different I mean? levels like i mean that's just how i think it's how people see things he sees yeah. the big picture and he he could coordinate if he had the resources, he could coordinate and fix this whole big problem that he sees. And we're just seeing, you know, we're seeing a smaller scale and feeling a smaller need. Yeah, yeah. In that whole picture. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know, man. It's freaking awesome, dude. I think what's awesome about the work that y'all are doing is you have the opportunity to, like, make a profound impact on individuals' lives that can fundamentally shift that just because of the nature of the types of work that y'all are doing, it's, it's incredible. And of course, most importantly, the mission behind what you do is I, I absolutely love it. You guys are doing awesome, awesome work. <clears throat> well, I want to, I want to dig in real quick to your faith, Justin. Um, I want to hear your testimony, man. I want to hear why you believe how you believe um, your testimony being why you believe the way you believe, where that started, and then also what has really set that into concrete for you, man. Uh, because, you know, you are highly, highly intelligent, highly accomplished. I know this is uncomfortable for you. Get over it. <laughs> Get over it, dude. You just are. Thank you. And, uh, and to find someone like you, but also... At the same time, so, someone like you from that, you know, highly accomplished in the world's eyes and society and what you've done, but also to have such a pure and real and tangible faith in Jesus Christ. There are other people out there like that, but it's, it's a rare dynamic. Well, and that, at your age, too, because yeah. that, I mean, our age is... It's starting to kind of steer away from it, you know? Yeah, totally. So you mind sharing your testimony with us, brother? If oh, I, absolutely. Okay, send it, brother. I want to hear it. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm very thankful. My parents uh, you know, are both Christians, and uh, we grew up in the church. Um, in elementary school, we went to a, a Christian school. Um, for Later in life, we, we didn't, but really having that foundation of, building up that initial relationship. So, I mean, for context, that was always there. But it's not that, you know, didn't believe or didn't, like, live it out. But it's, like, levels of depth of, like, to what extent, you know, were you, what did I believe? And, you know, it's growing up in the church, I think you can see a lot of people get comfortable with the relationship with God. I mean, I myself was, it was just, it was what we did. It's how we, we grew up. I'm super thankful that uh, my parents raised me in that way. But at the same time, it didn't really become real until going out and until really, truly facing adversity. Had to lean on it a little bit, right? Well, lean into it. <laughs> You know, God's part of it was part of the life, and you know, of course, I believed in God, and I thought at that time I was living out and you know trying to uh, you know live like Christ and live live in that way. But it wasn't until you really face adversity, and f for me, it wasn't until really venturing out of my own where it was some of the obstacles that I I went up against. It was a situation where there's no other explanation for how anyone could have got through that. 
if it weren't for God. No way. <laughs> yeah. Just And, uh, I mean, there's dozens of experiences I can recount, but there's a handful where God had to show me and teach me through this adversity. And naturally, if my my flesh is all... How can I do more? How can I work harder? How can, how, what can I do to overcome this? Come on, brother. And it's, it's great. I'm thankful that, you know, I, I have that trait and it's not a bad thing, but only having that aspect and not leaning on God completely was a crutch, I think, in many ways for me and my uh, personal faith journey. But there's so many moments over the past 10 years of where there are these impossible situations where it got to a point of where I had no other option but to say, God, I surrender, I give this to you, and may your will be done because <laughs> any the more I try to overcome this, myself, relying on myself, yeah. the bigger the problem mm. became bigger the the kind of chasm between what I thought was the ideal outcome and what I was trying to achieve but God had so many different plans and you know there's so many moments of you know working months towards some big deal and then that falling through and then you know God coming in and you know just providing some crazy other opportunity but then had that happened it would have led to some terrible outcome. And there's just so many of these, it has to be God moments that over the past uh, few years, it God really became real. Not that he wasn't before to me, but those life experiences were faith building and it made it so obvious to me that there's no other explanation, not just one encounter. We're talking many, many encounters of where it would have been impossible for me. Mm-hmm. And it was impossible for me. Mm-hmm. But, and uh, I'm a bit stubborn when it comes to self reliance sometimes. It's something yeah. I'm still perpetually working on. Um, I'm very persistent, very uh, perseverant in that way. But it's in those moments of where God taught me less of you and more of me, less of you, Justin, and and more of me. And despite the adversity, I'm super thankful that uh, he gave me those opportunities to really experience God's presence in a way that words or, you know, growing up in the church doesn't give you. It's it's real. Mm -hmm. And... that was uh really life changing in many ways mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you say I, I mean I totally get it man I mean I totally get it because this is something that was my biggest lesson in April this is our second year of business in April was our busiest month at least as of now of 2021 and I find myself this this resonates so much with me because I found myself in a position of saying I'm going to do this. I'm going oh, yeah. to do that. I'm going to make this right. product or this experience the best that anyone has ever seen. And you know what it did? It just it I found it wearing oh, me totally out, dude. I had nothing left. Like it, at the end of, of whatever it would was, uh, and for your things, it was it was obviously a different um, a, a different product or a different ex- experience. But the lesson was the same, whether it's a speaking engagement or a deal you were working or, or a challenge you were facing through Ring MD. The lesson is still the same. It's like the more you try to do in and of your, this makes no sense to you guys. Some of you guys, this makes no sense to you, and we're 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 walking also a fine line here between saying, "Oh, just God, just just take it right." Totally. Like that that obviously 
you still have to do the work that he puts before you. You have to do the work that's there that you can do, right? But you have to, I had to learn to really lean on him to deliver the result that needed to to happen, right? Whatever needed to come of the situation, that's what I had to lean on him to produce and to deliver, right? And I just had to be a faithful servant and say, I'm going to do the work that's there that you give me, right? But I can't turn this into something that I want it to be. Yes. Because it's just like beating my freaking head into the wall and I wear myself out and then this becomes an unsustainable lifestyle. Totally. And it's it's not easy sometimes, you know, because, no. I mean, we're, we're wired in a way of where, I mean, we've been blessed where we want to go out, get stuff done and, you know, make plans. And God gives us all many different gifts that, we need to use it for, you know, the furtherance of, uh, of his kingdom. But at the same time, it's super easy to, once the opportunities get bigger, once, you know, things are working out well to drop that reliance a bit. Yes. And it's super easy, even in the language and in our minds of saying, you know, what am I going to do? Like you mentioned, and it's so incredible how, God uses those moments to remind us of what matters. And yes, we want to, you know, be good stewards of what we've been blessed with. And yes, we want to you know, take what we have and, and bless others and go out and do good things in the world. But at the same time, we can't go at it alone because then it's empty. And then it's, all, it's about us. And I found myself in many moments, God using those challenges and adverse um, adversarial situations to remind me of the need to yield to his purpose. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's not doing nothing. It's not stopping. It's yielding, which is an intentional act of being still an intentional act of really surrendering. It's not doing nothing. It's intentionally yielding to allow him to work through you know, myself or, or others. Yeah, and to create and deliver the result <laughs> Absolutely. That, that needs to be delivered. I think when you, when you say the word yield, I think like you're merging onto an interstate. <laughs> you're yielding to those cars. Like if you just say, all right, I'm, I'm getting in there, <laughs> you're about to cause a wreck. Oh. But if you say, all right, where can my car fit in this path that's going this way? Because that's the way I want to go. And you fit in, then you just roll on. Or if you completely stop, yeah, you're gonna also <laughs> cross a wreck. That's oh, yeah. it. We see old people and people that can't drive doing that all the time when they're trying to yield <laughs> yep. onto an interstate. Yep, just completely stopping. Yep. Yeah. What a what a what a beautiful description that was, that of what great. that means, man. I mean, that's a, a wonderful description of of what we're talking about here. Because I think, again, a lot of people and even Christians. You're walking a fine line when you're having these conversations of, um, you. I've heard the term so many times, let go and let God, right? Yeah, well, yeah. maybe we should just say yield and let, let <laughs> yeah. God, right? So merging into that interstate that is his purpose for everyone within the body of Christ, right? Yeah. Merging into that. Man, what a, that's really, really powerful, yeah. Justin. It really is, man. Um, and Pastor Justin, Business Justin, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 no. <laughs> I, you know, I, I mean, this is just maybe this is a, a stupid question, but um, as you study and delve into your passion as it revolves around space, a seemingly eternal environment, does that ever butt heads or conflict with your faith? I mean, I don't know. I mean, of course. I mean, of course there's, I mean, if you look at science, whatever whatever that means, yeah. I mean, the common consensus does not align with, uh, in from a secular perspective, with a biblical worldview. Um, now, I'm of the belief that the further we understand how the world works and the natural laws that God set in motion, that it just reaffirms that, there is a creator there. God exists and has created us in his image, but also 
this world. And that's one of the things that over the past one to two years, getting back to nature. And I found that getting out and truly just being in nature allows us to experience God's creation in a way that when you reflect, this can't happen by chance. I mean, it's just, it's not scientific, this approach, but I found that, you know, I've never, never really feel closer to God than, you know, being out in nature and being out in, in creation away from the kind of distractions away from all the things that we can get caught up in. And yeah, space is, is a big place. Uh, it's, it's eternal. It's, uh, you know, it's huge. It's more than our minds can, at least my mind can, can comprehend. But, you know, we serve a big God who is all powerful in those ways that I don't have to understand every single nuance to, to know. And even though the scientific consensus may be something totally different for me, I found that diving into that more and just the complexity of all of that and how, even if the earth is a little bit closer to the sun, it's too hot for us as humans to live or a little bit further away, like just a little bit further away relatively. And it's too cold and life as we know it couldn't exist. It's the more you delve into that. And it's by no means am I an expert on any of that, but the more that me as just kind of an amateur learner who's interested in, in the world and interested in all of creation delves into that, the more it just reaffirms my faith. Actually, I found the complexity of it points to intelligent design. Exactly. Yeah. Which I think is the easiest part. Totally. Uh, of, for, for any human being to, uh, to recognize, uh, that intelligent design aspect in the universe and even just in the the micro processes that happen here on our earth, right? I guess the hard part for people is Jesus, the yes. cornerstone, right? <laughs> that is the hard part for for people to really grasp not that the message of Jesus or his purpose or his salvation is a hard message to understand. But I guess that's the hard part to buy into, mm-hmm. right? But I think a challenge of that a lot is because it requires us, and this is from my own experience, it requires us to set aside our ego and truly admit that we're incomplete without Jesus. Yeah. There is something more, and if we don't have that in our life, we're constantly yearning for something, and that something is is Jesus. Yeah. And at least in, in my experience in my life, that's how I found really reaffirms that it's tough though. Sometimes. Well, this, you you just struck a chord with me right there because, uh, as we, as we just kind of talk about faith, faith or the belief in a creator is not going to fill you up. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. you just it, it, and and we have seen this. I mean, we have we all have seen, especially now with uh, this whatever you want to call it, new age type oh, yeah. of belief, Mother Earth. This like the easy part. We should all be able to look around us and say, okay, this was created by an omnipotent omnipresent, all-powerful being outside of what we can understand, grasp, or see. Um, But that is not what's going to fill you up. Jesus Christ is the cornerstone and is the that that is the piece that is missing. That is the block, the building block that everything else has to be built upon. You have to take a look at this Jewish man, son of God named Jesus, and have to take a look at the fact and consider the fact that this guy rose from the dead. And you have to take a look at the reason why he went and willfully died for you. 
right? Mm -hmm. And then you have to wrestle with that. And if you can come to terms with that, that is what's going to fill that gaping part of you that is missing, I believe. Yeah. Well, not yeah. just fill it, but overflow your overflow. being with, Man, come with on. joy and peace. And, I mean, things that words can't even describe in terms of just life changing and transforming uh, in all ways. Yeah, yeah. It's, this is this is just really re redefining for me why he is called the cornerstone, or the you know that all everything else is built upon in in the Bible. Um, it's redefining that for me. Cause I you know I get to uh, I've known people all my life that are what society would call as agnostic, um, and you know they they have no problem saying yes this is creation and there is uh there is a spiritual aspect of life i've known those people all my life but they are literally blown to whichever way they're, they're never solidly rooted into anything when it comes to spirit right that spiritual part of us i see it happening all the time um amazing testimony man yeah um just seeing how your faith was set in concrete through the adversities that you faced and through those times where you had to freaking totally let go and yield to him. And then you then in turn saw the result of that yielding process. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just thankful that, you know, God is full of grace and, uh, even though it took a, me hitting rock bottom in many ways a couple times, uh, if you turn to him and uh, just call out to him, uh, he openly accepts and uh, unconditionally loves. And I'm extremely thankful for that. Words can't describe it, but uh, it's been a, a phenomenal journey in many ways of kind of taking those lessons and then also just living the life that and I, I mess up every single day, but trying to live a life like uh, Jesus does daily. Yeah. And you know, Justin, you know, moving forward, in the circles that you are in, in the circles that you're going to be in, wow, what a, what a, what a ripe harvest there's going to be within those circles of people that I'm not going to be able to reach because I don't have the skills, I don't have the, the reputation. I don't have the things that you have. You're going to be able to reach people that are never going to listen to the 307 podcast. Mm -hmm. They're never going to listen to some backwoods Navy SEAL wizard hermit <laughs> talking on a microphone. They're yeah. just not going to listen to them, man. A and I have a feeling that you're going to impact. You're going to impact people. People are going to see you within those circles, whichever way you go moving forward. Um, these high level individuals and say, man, I, there's something different about that dude. The same way we felt about you. You just have that yeah. presence about you, man. Thank you. You know what I mean? There's something different about that dude. I need to maybe once I get to know him a little bit, maybe I need to ask him about that. And, uh, I have confidence in your courage to, uh, to share that testimony with him, man. Yeah. Well, praise the Lord about that. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. No, it's awesome, brother. Awesome. Um, well, uh, I, you know, here in another two or three years when you're freaking sending rockets into space and there's no... Dude, last time I talked to you, you were doing something with coffee. <laughs> did that... Did that? Are you still pursue? Are you still doing anything with coffee? Yeah, that's a, a, a hobby project of me and my wife. It's uh, something that... Uh, I, I've gotten into coffee lately and we've... Uh, been curating that uh a bit but that's a just a side side project that uh i'm blessed to be able to work on with my wife yeah so. can can we can we get some coffee from you can <laughs> let listeners order some get no it's uh it's it's more of kind of scratching our own itch of trying to the coffees around the world that uh that we have really enjoyed and trying to bring that uh, to the u.s so but it's just for you right now <laughs> we have we have some uh, family and friends and uh, some 
some other people besides us using it, but uh, not yeah. for the general public yet. Well, it's been really difficult the past uh, past year with uh, supply chains with, with oh COVID yeah yeah and shutting down a lot of that, and so um, we've uh, we're kind of waiting to launch that more broadly okay. uh, once uh, things open up a bit more. Okay, all right. Well, like I say, back to my original comment here in the next two or three years when you're launching <laughs> ships into space and freaking coffee beans. You're bringing coffee beans in from no telling where, places I've never even heard of. We're going to bring you back on the podcast, <laughs> man. And if we can get you out here, maybe we can entice you into another range day and fit another podcast in on the side, man. Um, but it's just, for me, it was an absolute pleasure to get to know more about I, this none of I didn't know any of this stuff man you know and I'm glad we didn't have these conversations out on the basic course I'm glad we saved these conversations for now because we've built a personal relationship me and Blake I feel like we're we're we are friends and brothers we've built a yeah. personal relationship first and now we get to learn about you and what you've done, where you've been, and by no means do we know the depths of it, but now it's really cool. Yeah, It's been really a pleasure for me to get to learn about that side of you, man. I just can't thank you enough. Well, I, I can't thank you both enough, and uh, yeah, it's been a fun day, and uh, I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, man. Do you want anyone to find you and follow you anywhere, Justin? <laughs> I mean, you're a cool dude, man. I mean, there's going to be people listening to this that want to thank you for the conversation. Um, Instagram, Twitter, I'm I'm on most of the social networks under Justin Fulcher, my my first and last name. So okay, awesome, brother. Um, I'll post the links to uh, Justin's at least his Instagram handle in the show notes of this episode, and uh, y'all will be hearing from him again. He's going to be a you guys know by now. I don't have to convince you. He's going to be a cool person to watch now transitioning uh into what whatever's next and and uh it's Heck, gonna be he's awesome the, he's one of the top 30 in the world top be 30 in the sun top 30 under 30 boy <laughs> you better you better watch keep your eyes peeled <laughs> all right brother well, thank you both yeah man uh thank any you. anything else on your heart justin that that we missed that you want to put out i mean anything at all man i think uh I think we covered a lot today and yeah. uh, praise the Lord. I'm super thankful for uh, this opportunity to chat with you guys and uh, jump on the podcast. Had a lot of fun. Roger that. Blake, anything on you, brother? No, just thanks for not only coming out here, but answering the call to your life. You know, you could have, you could have shirked that real easy and went to college. You're super smart. You could have <laughs> got a job and made a lot of money and there'd have been a bunch of people in Southeast Asia without health care. Yeah. So thanks for answering yeah. the call. Thank Amazing you. story, man. All right, guys, this is the 3 of 7 podcast. Enough said. <laughs>